Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. week I'm sharing a featured artist as well as a guest interview. I'll share a bit about the featured artist here as well as sharing images of their work on Instagram and on the website. This week's featured artist is Marnie Mizell. Marnie is an artist and educator based in downtown New York City. She received her BFA in illustration from the School of Visual Arts in 2004, as well as a master's degree in art and art education from Columbia University Teachers College in 2012. She was selected for a special scholarship to Columbia as an employee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. After receiving her master's, she started teaching art at the Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts in New York. She's currently now part of the Visual Arts Department at Brooklyn High School of the Arts in Brooklyn, New York. Her artwork has also been shown through Dab Art, Soho Renaissance Factory, Air Gallery, Visual Aids, Site Brooklyn, Macy Gallery, Columbia University, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art Employee Art Show. When she is not teaching, Marnie is making and selling her handmade art and accessories via indie online platform Etsy. Marnie Mizell's artworks are guided by observations in everyday life. She recreates the robust energy of her urban habitat through layers of bright colors and found materials. Transparent and opaque relationships are explored and formed through connected lines and shapes in the context of abstract architectural structures. And I am excited to share Marnie's work. She's been a part of this community for a long time, and it's wonderful to be able to share what she's doing. So keep an eye on our Instagram, and we're also sharing on the website at teachingartistpodcast.com slash featured artists. And if you would like to submit to have your work featured, you can do that on our site at teachingartistpodcast.com slash opportunities. Catherine Rodriguez talked about being a third culture kid growing up in many countries and returning to the U.S. as a teenager, but not feeling at home. I loved how she talked about the space of transition, that time in motion and trying to capture that feeling in her work. She also shone a light on the world of freelance teaching artists, balancing teaching with art making and parenting. Catherine talked about the structure of her teaching time before the pandemic and how she brought the city of Chicago into the classroom through field trips to art venues, as well as sharing local artists, working to create equity and improve access to cultural resources. She shared the idea of curriculum development centered around local BIPOC artists rather than including them as an exception to the white-centered curriculum. That brought up a great question that we should all be asking ourselves. What is at the center of your teaching? Catherine Rodriguez was born in Georgia and within weeks was on the move to her family's next destination. Her family moved to 10 different locations within the next 13 years, including Brazil, Mozambique, Portugal, and Germany, before finally settling in Illinois. This transient lifestyle left her with a deep interest in cultural identity, longing, domestic life, mapping, and the natural world. Her work is both an investigation of and a reflection on the collection of experiences and memories that shape her identity. Catherine received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from the University of Illinois and a Master of Science in Art Education from the Massachusetts College of Art. She is currently a teaching artist in Chicago. Let's hear from Catherine. 
So I am here with Catherine Rodriguez and so excited to hear more about your background and all the places you've been, the things you've been doing. Could you kind of start with a little bit of background, how you got into teaching and then also art making? Absolutely. And whether those two kind of overlap? Yes. Thank you so much for having me. So I think it's hard to talk about how I became an artist without acknowledging my childhood and how I grew up. It's a little unique. My father was in the army and so we moved every one to three years, I would say. So a lot. By the time I was in high school, I think I'd lived in like 13 places or something, something along those lines. Wow. So, and from third grade through eighth grade, we were outside of the US. So coming back to the States for high school was total culture shock. (laughs) Especially we moved to central Illinois, which I had never been to before. And my parents are both from California. So I think being immersed in so many different cultures, there's a term called like third culture kid, where you're sort of brought up outside of your own culture. I think just opened Mm -hmm. my eyes to so many different things to just, you know, we were always we looked at art a lot everywhere we were. My parents aren't particularly creative, but both of my grandmothers are. And so I feel like their influence was Mm. sort of always there. Even though we didn't grow up where they lived, we would always return to visit them in California when we could. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, just always projects happening, wonderful art books around to look through. So I think those two things were sort of like these you know, baselines of where my creativity came from. As a child, I liked art class, but I wasn't sort of innately good at drawing or painting. And so it really wasn't until high school when I took my first photography class. I think I was a sophomore and it just clicked. It was so, it was just wonderful. It was a great feeling to feel like, oh, I felt creative for a long time, but didn't really find my channel, so to speak. And so to have this medium really click with me and, you know, I just was like an instant love affair, so to speak. So that was really it. And it's kind of from then it was like, okay, definitely want to, you know, pursue this in in college. And it really wasn't until I would say my junior or senior year of undergrad that I began to really think about, you know, what's, what's next, right? What's, what's going to be my life? What's my life going to be like after undergrad? And I began to think about art education. It was really, you know, so subjective at the, you know, I started to kind of question some of, you know, the methods that my professors were, were using in their classes. And I just was like, you know, this, what a fascinating topic. And so I decided to, you know, take a year off and, and work and, and apply to grad schools for art education. So it was a really sort of nice synergy of something that I was already really interested in and then understanding the potential for, you know, connection with other people and also just learning. I'm like, I love learning. I love researching. That's just something that is just going to be part of my life forever. (laughs) And I think artists and educators are, that's it, right? That's what so much of what that's about. So I was like, and I was lucky enough to find a graduate program that Mm -hmm. was called like the artist teacher program at MassArt in Boston. And so their philosophy was really about maintaining your artistic practice and having that be a huge part of your teaching practice also, which I was really drawn to at the time. I think I didn't feel at that time ready for an MFA style of program. And so this was a way to kind of do a little bit of each, feeling like I could still kind of work on my artwork. I had you know a thesis of, of art at the end of the program, but mm-hmm. also learning about education, having that practical experience of student teaching and all of that as well. So I really felt like that set me up for, you know, what I could do next. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing program. It was great. Honestly, I I knew I had been living in Chicago for a year after I finished college. And I knew I wanted to move someplace that I'd never lived before because I, you know, still get a little itchy to move. (laughs) I'm somewhere for too long. (laughs) And, you know, I wanted to sort of challenge myself to kind of be, you know, totally independent and on my own. And it was such a wonderful, it was wonderful. It was a great experience. It was a small art school, which for undergrad, I went to a really big school. And so it was nice to have that Mm -hmm. contrast. Yeah, it was a really wonderful experience for sure. Yeah. And how did they encourage like bringing your own artwork into the classroom? I think we really talked a lot about, you know, 
because our studio classes were really well balanced with education classes, they were, you know, we talked about all of it together. So to, so it was almost like when we were doing curriculum planning, mm -hmm. I think the first sort of practical teaching was, was like a Saturday studios program for kids in the community. And so when we were, you know, planning curriculum, I think it, we were co-teaching so we could, it was more collaborative and mm -hmm. just thinking about like, okay, well, what are we exploring in our own artwork? What are we interested in? Not just media, but, you know, top like ideas, topics, concepts, and things like that, that again, we were really lucky to have a lot of latitude in terms of what we could mm -hmm. propose and teach. And so I've been just so grateful. I've had that opportunity there and then continue throughout my career to, to be able to work in places is where, you know, there's a lot of freedom in terms of that. So it's been really wonderful. Yeah. And do you still kind of work that way? Like kind of planning your curricula around your own work and interests? I would say sometimes yes. And also mm -hmm. it's usually either that or again, being in Chicago, we have a ton of galleries and museums that are always you know, changing and putting on new shows. And I would say a lot of times my classes start from either a new exhibit that's about to open mm -hmm. that I think would tie in really well and or something that I'm also working on in my own work. Because again, we're able to go like on field trips. I think that's so important to see art in person in real life and to interact with it in that way. And so that's for a long time been kind of the genesis of what I'll sort of plan plan my classes around. Yeah, that's amazing. And such yeah. a, a benefit being in a place like that where, you know, you have access to totally. so many different exhibits. Yeah, totally. And I think also, you know, it can be intimidating at times, especially as like a young person to just kind of walk mm -hmm. into a gallery or a museum that maybe you've never been to before. And so I love being able to kind of break that down and, you know, show students the resources that they have that they might not know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a huge thing that access that A, they don't know it exists. And then B, even if they do know, it feels unwelcoming. Like it doesn't feel like a place where they're totally welcomed inside. <laughs> so absolutely. Yeah. And hopefully that will change and continue to change. But it's yeah, that's certainly the case sometimes. And we've had a couple experiences at some galleries that were a little, a little challenging. But overall, you know, once you go in, people that are working everywhere are very happy to just have new faces there to interact with the artwork. So I think, you know, looking at work inside of the classroom, outside of the classroom, and it, there's just never enough mm -hmm. for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how has that all shifted with the pandemic. Have you been able to still do like Zoom field trips or anything? <laughs> no, unfortunately, I am not teaching right now. After mm -hmm. grad school, I moved back to Chicago. I started working at a wonderful nonprofit after school arts organization here. And I was on staff there for about 10 years. And then once I was, I want to say I had just had my first child. I went to part-time. And then after my second child, my daughter was born, I just started doing freelance teaching artist work because for us in childcare, that's just what worked. Mm -hmm. And so I've been lucky enough to still teach at that same institution and just adore it. But my last class was March, you know, like 11th of yeah. last year. And so they, you know, were closed for quite a time and then have been doing some virtual programming, but only like a handful. And it's just, and again, I have, have been in charge of two kids mm. remote learning for the whole year and it just hasn't been possible. And it's a bummer as, as I'm dying to get back into the studio, into the classroom. Just, and it's actually been really lovely to understand what an important part of my life it is. You know, when you don't have it anymore, it's like, wow, okay, this was, this community is something that I'm really missing. And, you know, I've had time to really think about what I want my teaching practice to look like when it can happen again, which hopefully is in the near future. And, you know, how as my kids are getting older now, I can hopefully expand and teach at, you know, more places and, you know, how I want to teach. It's just, it's, there's been a lot of learning going on in the last year, for sure, which has been a gift, really. Yeah. And I mean, it's shifted in so many ways. And I've heard from other teaching artists, you know, there's so many people I talk to are employed within the school district. They're either full-time or even part-time. Right. 
teachers through the school district. And most of those people seem to have kept their jobs, but their jobs have shifted dramatically and lots of challenges. And then the teaching artist world is this sort of separate world. And that's where I am too, working for a nonprofit that partners with the school or that does community programs. And I feel like that world has been hit really hard in terms of budgets. Exactly. You know, especially funders. I know for my organization, they were very transparent with us, the teaching artists, and said, you know, several of our largest funders shifted their funding away from the arts towards COVID response, Mm -hmm. which was, you know, like you can't fault them for that. But it also... Right. We were like, well, can't they kind of join somewhere? Like, isn't there a spot sure, where there's course. like arts funding that relates to what's going on? Yeah, I guess all of that to say that I totally feel your position and see that there are a lot of teaching artists that have either been suddenly laid off, like so many people, or just had hours cut dramatically. I had my hours cut a lot and just everything shifted. But it does, I mean, I guess we're lucky that we're, you know, have a relationship where our partners can help absolutely support the family and all of that. Exactly. And I think also understanding that coming from that place of privilege, I don't because, you know, we're doing okay. My husband's still working. Mm -hmm. And so I also felt like, okay, you know, if they're only offering so many Mm -hmm. courses at a time, so many jobs for teaching artists, many of whom are much younger than I am and are like desperate for any kind of work, I need to take a step back. And also, you know, I think that was definitely part of it as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our student population come from every corner of the city, which is Mm -hmm. such a wonderful gift in typical times. But now it also, I would imagine, makes it more complicated in terms of them understanding how to offer like in-person programming again. But, you know, just crossing my fingers that it gets worked out soon. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm hopeful there's vaccines coming out. Yes. So many educators are getting it. I've got my first one. (laughs) Oh, I know. I'm like counting down the days till officially because I'm freelance. I don't have a association with a particular, you know, I feel like I can't like say that, but at least where we are, April 12th, it should be available to adults. And I'm just like (sighs) going to be sitting at my computer hoping I can just sign myself up. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Yeah. But then, I mean, you also brought up the the challenge of having kids at home learning online and, you know, obviously they're like, you you weren't totally homeschooling. You were working with their yes. schools yes, correct. still. So, I mean, there's a difference there, but it's still a lot to manage. It's and- a lot. And I think for me, you know, so our kids are second grade and kindergarten, so they're still pretty young. Mm-hmm. And my daughter is in kindergarten and it's half day kindergarten. So it's like, you know, two hours, two and a half hours sort of. And it's tough. I mean, it's really tough. And even as an educator with my second grader, it's just different when it's your child. It's not, at least for me, it's been challenging at times. And they actually last week just went to hybrid. So I had my first taste of them not being (laughs) at home all day, which was bizarre. Honestly, it's a mixed bag of emotions, I would say, because on one hand, you know, I like Mm -hmm. being able to control our environment and know that we're safe. Right. And then having to kind of let go of that a little bit. But I think ultimately it will be better for Mm -hmm. them to have that connection with their teachers and social interactions and Mm -hmm. and all of that. So yeah, for me, for the past almost actually exactly a year, even if they're on Zoom, I'm still kind of having to like hover, you know, that feeling where you're not quite ever away or it's like 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. And so that's been a challenge. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I also have a kindergartner doing remote learning. Oh, (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) I know. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 I'm it's very like before this year, she didn't have an iPad or, you know, she didn't really use technology. And the speed at Mm -hmm. which she has like figured everything out is impressive. A little scary almost. (laughs) I'm like, wow. (laughs) I totally agree. (laughs) Yes. Both of our kids have had their teaching us at this point, certain things, if like certain things go wrong, they're like, oh, it's okay. I got it. I I know what to do. And it's, (laughs) it's a little bizarre. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's totally the same here. I'm (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Just like, how are you? 
How yeah. do you know that? <laughs> no. And then I feel like it's helpful to see that as a parent as well, to kind of get a, a little glimpse into what, I mean, I know you're not teaching right now, but even when things do open up to have had that glimpse of what the students were right. potentially dealing with at home and just thinking through other challenges like you know, our kids are lucky that we've had sort of flexible time to be able to help them. But there's so many kids who don't have, you know, their parents are frontline workers mm-hmm. or just overwhelmed with their work at mm-hmm. home and, and can't be there like that. Absolutely. I feel like it's helpful to see that side. I think so, too. Absolutely. And being, you know, most mm-hmm. of what I teach is photo based darkroom and digital. And so I've been, you know, this whole time kind of thinking about like, how can this translate to be taught virtually is just, it's really challenging because it's so Mm -hmm. equipment based and, you know, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And I do a fair amount of sort of non-traditional, like non-lens based photo techniques, you know, like cyanotypes and things of that nature, which I think can happen, but it's definitely something that I'm trying to figure out because, you know, who knows in the future or, or even how long this current pandemic lasts, I think it's good to sort of expand my toolkit, so to speak, and really think about these alternative ways of interacting and teaching because, you know, mm-hmm. I think it's just, it can't hurt. Yeah. And then thinking about the all the alternatives and the materials, the equity issues there, And we've touched on this a bit, but I always like to kind of explicitly get into how to create an anti-racist environment in our teaching. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And that's, you know, I've been, again, lucky enough to pretty much my entire career, I've been able to work with really diverse communities of students that come from all over the city and our courses are actually two and a half hours long. They're really long. And so they meet once a week. And to have that extended amount of time, you know, conversations can happen and you can really like get to know the individual students and understand what they're thinking about and what they're curious about and how they're feeling about, you know, things happening in the world. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that along with always looking at, I think the art that we show in classrooms is so important. There's this really lovely Mm -hmm hashtag program. I don't know what you would call it. It's called First Day, First Image. Have you mm-hmm. heard of this? No. I'll have to look It's it really wonderful. I heard, yeah. I've heard about it a couple years ago. It's basically a hashtag that you can use on Instagram to document mm-hmm. the first image that you show on the first day of your course. Mm-hmm. And it's basically, you know, a way to sort of expand the canon and not keep regurgitating the same, mm-hmm. you know, heavy hitters that we've all seen that are typically male, white, etc. And so yep. I think we all know. So it's really, I think, focusing on contemporary art. Like I said, I oftentimes will base a lot of my classes around an exhibition happening that we can go visit, mm-hmm. usually by contemporary artists. I love showing work by Chicago artists also, because again, it just becomes more real and kind of like making that the center, Mm -hmm. obviously, like often BIPOC artists is what I'm showing, what I'm focusing on and really having that be the center of what we're looking at, not the like exception, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. I think is just so important. But obviously also, you know, in addition to this year has just been so much Mm -hmm. about learning in a lot of different ways and just really examining and thinking about, you know, assumptions that I've certainly made over the years. And I think really just being as mindful and and thoughtful as possible in terms of how we approach teaching is just super important. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like this time at home has given, I mean, I don't feel like I have more time. (laughs) I feel (laughs) pretty overwhelmed as I'm sure most of us do. Yes. But it's given, I don't know, maybe space just to reflect and read and really kind of think more deeply about what you what we've been focusing on in our teaching and in the classroom. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And then yeah. that's a practice that continues just kind of constantly coming back and reflecting and checking in with yourself. Yeah, definitely. And I think I mean, yeah, the stack of books I have is enormous. I, I would love to honestly just take a week and just read. That would be a dream oh, for yes. me because <laughs> that's always also challenging with, with two little ones running around, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it's so important. And the, the access to, you know, information and it's just 
you know, it's so, it's so available. And I think Mm -hmm. it's so important to take advantage of all of the wonderful resources that are out there right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just not, you know, there's no reason to be complacent in any way, especially with teaching. And that's, again, in the model that I typically teach in, they're sort of like 10 week cycles. And so there's Mm -hmm. a new course happening every 10 weeks. And it's a great way to sort of reinvent like, oh, okay, I'm going to try this this time. And actually that didn't really mm-hmm. work so much. And so I want to really focus on this aspect of, you know, critique or whatever it is. And so it's been, that's also, I, again, like a gift that I feel like I've been given in terms of having that flexibility. And within that, like with the 10 week courses, do you have the same students coming back or is it shifting each time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same students for 10 weeks and then it's two and a half hours. So it's a really (laughs) nice like number of contact hours that you get. The ideal is when you have students that kind of keep taking your classes because then you have that lovely like in schools where you really can have these like long relationships Mm -hmm. with students. I I love that. And I don't always get that in this model, but there Mm -hmm. are a handful of students that I have. And it's so it's just really wonderful just to see how they can progress through their own artwork. And it's been great. Yeah. And then I feel like it might be interesting just to kind of go into what teaching looked like for you, especially for people who are not teaching artists working with an outside organization who haven't done this sort of more community-based education. Was it after school only or were you there during the day? Kind of what was the schedule like? What was the structure like? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about that. So, you know, because it it is a very unique situation and not all Mm -hmm. after school programs are like this. But this particular one, we had our own studios, our own building. So all the students came to us. Mm -hmm. There's so many other programs I know that go into the schools. Mm -hmm. But for, for this particular one, the students come to us and we serve students in middle school and high school. So sixth Mm -hmm. grade through 12th grade. And the courses typically are after school, like starting at, I'm trying to remember now, like 4.30 to (laughs) 7 kind of time frame, or Mm -hmm. on Saturdays in the morning or in the afternoon. And so there were Mm -hmm. weekend options and then also during the week options. Yeah, And yeah, it was really, they do have some Mm -hmm. partnerships occasionally during the day where students can come on a field trip and kind of just get a taste of what classes there are alike. And so I've participated in some of those Mm -hmm. as well. When I was on staff, actually, we also did a lot of PD for school teachers. And so we would have in the summer and during the school year, these sort of extended workshops for CPS, Chicago Public School teachers to come and also just make art and get to know the space and be inspired. (laughs) So yeah, that's but in terms of the, the main program, it's typically like after school, because our students are coming from all over. We actually did move the schedule a little bit later. I think it was more like five to seven 30 because, you know, some of them were having to take trains and buses and it, you know, it takes a long time depending on where their school was. And so, yeah, the energy obviously during the week is a little different than on like a yeah. Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning. I've taught at all the different times and they both have their sort of pros and cons, but just having that length of, you know, a two and a half hour class is just so great, especially with art, because, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes when you're just getting set up, it's like time to start cleaning up sometimes. And so it's really, it's really w- wonderful just to have time to have making time, looking at art time, possibly a field trip or, you know, going outside to shoot. And it just kind of encompasses all of it, which is really great. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I've i taught in situations like that where there's a lot more time. And then the last, you know, before we went to everything virtual, my kindergarten classes were 30 minutes. And I was just oh, like, wow. <laughs> what do I do in that? You know, you get them to sit down and, and listen. And that takes 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> It's like, welcome. Okay, now leave. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's so, so tricky. Yeah. There's, those timelines can be really, really tricky. So. Absolutely. That's amazing to have a longer time. I know. Yeah. I feel. And again, I was for the last several years, I've just been freelance. And so every term you have to kind of repropose a course. And so, you know, you weren't necessarily guaranteed a spot. Luckily, I've been lucky and I've had a long standing relationship. And I think they always photos courses are very popular. And so they always need a lot of photo teaching artists. But, you know, that mm-hmm. is also kind of part of the 
gamble is that you're not always sure if you're going to be able to teach. But that's part of why I'm mm-hmm. really looking forward to expanding where I'm teaching and, you know, what communities I'm working with and organizations mm-hmm. and, and all of that and hopefully the near future. Yeah. And then would you be thinking about offering your own like private classes as well? Is that something you'd be interested in or? That's such a good idea. I've (laughs) never, I haven't really thought about that, honestly, but I'm going to jot that one down. I will think about it for (laughs) sure. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of sort of management stuff that might not be as right. as fun as interesting <laughs> true yeah. true but i think there there typically are you know especially with something like photography the people are you know so ubiquitous it's everywhere right now mm-hmm. right and i think people are very interested in it so you mm-hmm. know i still love the like analog film like that's what i do in my own work and so if anybody is mm-hmm. interested in learning about that i'm always so happy to share my enthusiasm for it so <laughs> Yeah. Uh, And then with the organization, so the hours were sort of evenings and weekends. Were you also, and maybe this is too like nitty gritty detail level, but I'm always curious about just how these organizations sort of work with teaching artists, how they're supporting teaching artists. Sure. You know, I'm, I feel very lucky that I get, you know, paid planning time, paid curriculum planning time, paid setup, and all of that time is like, you know, when you're hourly, like that time matters. Totally. <laughs> so yes, yeah, it absolutely does. And that is part of the contract where I've been teaching in terms of they do include time for curriculum planning. There are meetings mm-hmm. like a preterm meeting, a midterm meeting, and then a postterm meeting for reflection. Those are all paid. So they've been really careful about, and actually when I was on the education staff, that was a big part of my job was creating resources for our teaching artists. Mm-hmm. And professional development opportunities. And because, you know, it's not always easy as a artist to just jump in and be able, if you haven't taught before, to just Mm -hmm. kind of jump in and do it. And so they've been really great about offering that support, which is, which is lovely. Yeah. And I love that. There's almost like two sides to this PD world. There's like you talked about earlier, offering PD for teachers to really get deeper into the art making. But then I feel like the flip side of that is like making sure that your teaching artists have some teaching background, like have a little bit of that pedagogy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's it's tough because it's, it you know, it, it looks great to have an organization hiring artists, right? Working artists who are teaching also, but you know, depending on who you're teaching, or even if many of them, you know, taught at the college level, it's not quite the same as middle school, right? Or even high school. And so I think trying to bridge that gap and really understand, you know, who it is you're teaching and kind of where they're at developmentally is super important. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it easier for everybody in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey listeners, I'm jumping in here because I have an ask of you. If you are enjoying the show, I would so appreciate your support. I'm humbled and grateful for all the interest in this show over the past several months and for the messages I've received letting me know that this podcast has resonated with you. It has been so inspiring to hear from you. Thank you. This podcast does take time, effort, and resources to share with you every week. And I want to, I plan to, keep it going and stay focused on highlighting and inspiring artists who teach while also continuing to grow this community and dreaming up additional ways to help you. One way to accomplish this is through direct listener support. Your support would really help the show and community grow. So I've set up a link where you can quickly and easily support the show. The whole thing will take less than 60 seconds. It's at anchor.fm slash teachingartistpodcast slash support. You can contribute one, five, or ten dollars per month. If Teaching Artist Podcast is a part of your week and you love what we're doing, please consider visiting anchor.fm slash teaching artist podcast slash support, or just clicking the link in the show notes and supporting us in any way that you can today. Well, 
I would love to get maybe more into your art making. Yes. Maybe if you could start by just sort of describing your work, which I know is a hard thing. Yes, absolutely. No, this is, this is, you know, again, not, not, I know this year has been so bizarre and challenging, Mm -hmm. but another gift for me has been a a major sort of coping mechanism, self-care, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, has been really diving into art making for me. Mm -hmm. I think when I was teaching regularly and had very, very small children. And, you know, I, I was always making work, but it was very, it was just on a much smaller scale. I wasn't, yeah. you know, I would show here and there, but it was just very contained. And I feel like this last year has been really for me all about pushing myself out of my comfort zone and really just like making work as much mm-hmm. as I can. So it's been really wonderful to be able to dive into that. Mm-hmm. So I would say, okay, this is tricky. My work is is very personal. I would say it's generally an exploration into my identity. And, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the years that has changed from being a lot about, again, mm-hmm. my childhood, how I grew up, feeling, you know, not really understanding what it's like to be from one place. So a lot about cultural mm-hmm. identity and things of that nature. And through the years, that's really transitioned to thinking about my identity now as a, as a parent, as a mother, and as an artist, and how those you know work together or not. I'm really interested in the psychology of motherhood mm-hmm. and this idea of sort of transcendence in a domestic space. And so again, even when I was teaching, mm-hmm. my life was pre. I was home most of the time, right? I was the primary caregiver, mm-hmm. and thinking about how to you know not just necessarily succumb to the sort of mundane day-to-day routine of all of that, but really trying to find the magic where it is and what that looks like. And so that's kind of what my work has been a lot about the last, I would say, three or four years. And it's mostly photo-based, mostly black and white, and usually manifests in either very abstract works or self-portraits. And so those are kind of like the two lanes that I'm currently working in. Ah, oh, I love that. The the idea of transcendence in the domestic space and, and finding magic. That's really beautiful and really relatable, I feel like, for parents who are in this day-to-day, like moment to moment, just kind of getting through. <laughs> But seeing all these little beautiful sparks happening. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely feel that there's there's this like push and pull of, you mm-hmm. know, just, mm-hmm. you know, just eat the food I gave you. Right. <laughs> and then right. at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, noticing like the way she's like holding her spoon and the way her hair exactly. looks in the sunlight or, you know, all these little things. Totally. And yeah. I think, yeah, just thinking about this desire to like, you know, leave and be free and just like not, you know, be able to do things by myself, but also <laughs> really worrying about being safe and contained in a way and like not, you know, exposing mm-hmm. our kids or ourselves to any, you know, anything. And so the push pull is very real. And it's actually just read something a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. about this idea of the liminal space. This was so inspiring to me and I actually wrote it down. So the quote was embracing the mystery and power of transition from what has been to what will be. Mm. And I feel like so much of my life and my work has been about these sort of in between, like, I'm not really from there. I'm not really from here, but thinking about just, yeah, the past and the future and sort of where we're at now. And again, that's just, I don't know, that's just something that I've been really trying to explore recently. Yeah, I can see that the beauty in the the time when you're moving from one to the other. Exactly. Like that sort of that's a shifting thing. Like you're in the process of motion and how do you exactly. capture that? Exactly. Yeah. And honestly, so the big body of work that I've been working on the last couple of years are these sort of abstracted images of these light reflections and refractions that are happening in our house. And so again, they're changing like second to second. And I've always been Mm -hmm. drawn to like trying to document things of that nature. So things that are very ephemeral, very, you -hmm. know, you see it one second and then you don't. And a lot of my work previously had to do with sort of mapping and 
cartography also, given my <laughs> interest in sort of, you know, culture and, and geography and things like that. And so I think even though like literally I'm not using maps per se in my work, but there is this this performative thing of like cataloging and mapping things that I'm still mm. definitely drawn to for sure. Yeah. Ooh. Could you talk <laughs> more about that sort of cataloging? Um, yeah. I, like where does that come out? Yeah. I don't know. It's some, something about my brain that loves, you know, sort of like f- systems and frameworks and things like, like that. And so I think, mm. I mean, honestly, the rich, the witching hour began when my kids were really, really like babies. And, you know, we moved into our current house, our first house when they were really young. And again, like being sort of feeling like I was sort of homebound and noticing this like time of day late in the day where these like Mm -hmm. amazingly beautiful, like light refractions were happening. And it was just like on my phone at first, just like, I have to document this. Like I just, Mm -hmm. it was just like this compulsion to do that. And even now with, you know, self portraits or other things, there's just a way of like Mm -hmm. working that feels there's something about the action of doing it and how I'm doing it that feels like I'm cataloging something, if that makes sense. And so it's very, it's very satisfying. Like even in, I have done a few little drawing projects. I would by no means consider Mm -hmm. myself to be a good person who draws, but there are these certain projects I've done that are recreating images from certain places that I've lived. And so thinking about memory and and what you kind of hold on to and the things that at the time felt very mundane, but now have Mm -hmm. this elevated status of being like the one of the most important things from my time there, probably maybe because of photos that I, you know, have been looking out over the years or who knows what, but Mm -hmm. I've been sort of like meticulously recreating them using drawing. And so even that act is like Mm -hmm. very kind of tedious in a way, but very satisfying. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> and and I like like how in there you talk about photos and it just made me think how photographs influence memory. Absolutely. That, you know, people talk about like take a photo with your brain and there is an element of that, that you kind of have these like memories sort of snapshotted, but then also the actual photos mm-hmm. that you're taking create these memories and like build up these these little moments. A hundred percent. And yeah. even some of the work that I've done in the past is really about like, even just like the order of where I've lived, it became this rote thing mm-hmm. where I was like, I was born here and then I moved here and then da, 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 da. And there's like these 12 mm-hmm. or 13 places that I have to just kind of like always have sort of memorized. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, there's just something about, it's almost like how I can keep remembering is that I have to like, keep that repetitive motion going, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think that's definitely always in the background. Yeah. When I work. And were your parents diplomats? Were they, what was? My dad was. So yeah. he he was in the army, but then when I was in second grade, he sort of went the diplomatic route. So yeah, he would work mm-hmm. at the American embassy where we lived until mm-hmm. our last spot was in Germany. And that was, we, that was actually the first time we lived on a base, like an army base, which is a whole mm-hmm. nother cultural experience for sure. So yeah, I I was mm-hmm. lucky enough to really grow up going to international schools. And so my friends were from everywhere. And, you know, it was very idyllic in a lot of ways. I was definitely a shy sort of introverted kid. And so obviously there are tough parts to being like the new kid all the time. But generally where we were moving, mm-hmm. that was the norm. So there were there was the diplomatic community or people whose parents worked for various organizations or companies that, you know, had people kind of coming and going pretty frequently. And so it felt sort of normal until I moved, my dad retired mm-hmm. and I moved back to the States to a small college town. And it was definitely like, oh, whoa, <laughs> this is like culture shock. And, and also just, I feel so outside of this, but again, mm-hmm. you know, I was also an angsty teenager, yeah. so I'm sure that had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's, there's an interesting thing there about, you know, coming right. home, like you're coming back to your, your country, but yes. like I'm say I'm putting quotes around that because I'm sure it didn't feel like home, like that sort of being maybe told, I don't know if you were told like, oh, we're going back to the US, we're going back home. Like now you're back in America and you're an American. Yeah. 
but not feeling like that fit. Exactly. And so we would, you know, like I said, go back and return and, and, and visit family in California where my parents are from. And that Mm -hmm. would be like our summer, you know, we would go for like a month in the summer when we could. But other than that, it was like, oh, I think my high school, you know, I had no frame of reference for what an American high school was like other than TV. Right. And so it was definitely, it was a shift for sure. And, and now so many years later, I mean, I've lived in the Midwest for a very long time at this point. And yet still, I don't like my identity still feels very fluid in that way. I don't necessarily, I don't feel from here per se. Mm -hmm. I feel connected here, but I also, yeah, it's just, it's a different way of thinking about that idea and how geography Mm -hmm. can be sort of important, but also not. It just depends. You know, it's like, I feel very connected to certain places I've lived where I was only there for two or three years, mm-hmm. you know? So it's, it's kind of an interesting conundrum Yeah, that I think about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that helps. I mean, coming back to teaching, I feel like that helps with kind of understanding where students might be coming from as well. And just, you know, that some maybe have had a variety of experiences in other places or their parents have. And that that feeling of like, absolutely connectedness, but disconnectedness. Yeah. Yeah. And I something that I like to share with my students on the first day, just just to kind of open that door, because a Mm -hmm. lot of them might, you know, they may have moved here from a different country, or their parents did, or they lived in a different state, or or who knows what, or they're just from Chicago. But I just think it's just interesting to just talk about just to kind of Mm -hmm. open that door. Because Mm -hmm. yeah, I know, it's something that I feel like is unique, but also fairly universal, I think, in a lot of ways, when, you know, especially young people thinking about their identity and what that means and, you know, what what's involved in like, you know, is where you're from a part of that or not? Or anyway, that's just all things that I think are really, really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And then it makes me think, too, about like sports and how, you know, especially I mean, I have I'm so not interested, but I have so many (laughs) students that get like really, really excited about like, we are Dodgers fans, you know, like we're right, right. (laughs) And that's tied up in your place where you're from. Or, you know, some of them will will like kind of argue against each other and they're they're fans of some other team because of where their parents are from or whatever, you know. Exactly. No, that's a good point. Culture becomes part of it. (laughs) Yes, for sure. For sure. Yeah, it's so Just interesting. Another, another like little point of connection. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear more also about like the business side of art, which I I don't know. I feel like it's a hard thing, at least for me, just figuring out this whole exhibiting and selling and like, how do you kind of manage that within your artwork? Is that something you're thinking about? Is it something you're, you know, like, where are you in that, in that world? (laughs) Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, like, I think this is a big time of growth for me in that area. I, I Mm -hmm. up until now have been, you know, I'll like uh, put something in a group show here and there. I'll, you know, or like a benefit for a, a something that I'm, you know, passionate about and, and we'll, we'll sell occasionally. And it's been fine, but not like, I feel like I haven't really put a lot of energy into, into that. And again, I just, I'm really mm-hmm. feeling compelled to like share my work way more than I have in the past. I think because I'm probably just, mm-hmm. I don't know, actually, maybe it's my age and I'm feeling a little bit less like intimidated by all of it or who knows, but because my work is so personal, it's tough for me sometimes, right. To like put myself out there in that way. But having said that, just dipping my toe mm-hmm. into these these communities in the past year, so like the Stay Home Gallery, Artist Mother Podcast, your podcast. I mean, there's all of these things that I'm just like finding somehow that are all interconnected that I've been really, I feel very lucky to have found. And so I'm trying mm-hmm. to just to submit to like anything that feels, you know, appropriate and that that would work with my work. I'm definitely trying to just like put myself out there in every way, which has been really lovely. I've been, you know, having success in that area, at least more than I have. And it's really wonderful just to hear feedback from others. And but it's definitely a work in progress. I'm still learning about, you know, the best ways to do that. And but also trying not to get too sucked into that so that I'm not just working on my work, you know what I mean? And so it's a tricky balance, I think sometimes, 
So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm definitely like working on trying to simultaneously really work on the work and be thoughtful about that and get it to where I want it to be. And then also trying to not be as restrained and shy about putting myself out there and sharing my work to yeah, communities who I think would be interested. Yeah, I love that. And thinking about it in that way that you're, you know, sharing what you're doing and putting it out there and really focusing on where you feel like it fits and where it can, yeah, like where you already kind of have a voice and, and there's an audience that wants to hear that voice and needs to hear it. Totally. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's the ideal, right? And, you know, again, it's, it's always a work in progress and just, just thinking also about like the back catalog of so many images that I have, then just trying to like mm -hmm. organize that and think about, you know, how that can tie into what I'm doing now or exist as, as its own thing. I mean, it's just a constant work in progress, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that makes me think with photography, if, I feel like it can be a very quick medium. Right. But then in terms of, you know, like, you take the picture and you can take there a whole is. bunch yeah. of them, like right after <laughs> yeah. each other. But then yeah. the work becomes, you know, I know for some people, the work is a lot of that time in the work is setting up and and sort of planning a photo. Mm -hmm. But it mm -hmm. sounds like maybe for you, a lot of the time is more in the after the curating and sort of deciding on which of these, you know, photos that I've taken are are the ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think mm -hmm. with I'm realizing that I have a lot of work that is almost like laying the groundwork for other projects, if that makes sense. So like I will mm. have a ton of like landscape photos and just like kind of like travel photography and things like that. I'm very inspired by like the natural world. And I have a lot of that, which I think I don't know that they need to sort of exist as a fine art body of work in that way. Mm -hmm. But they do exist. And they were sort of like, like I said, laying the groundwork for some of these other projects that I'm working on now that I'm very deliberate in. So I shoot on medium format film. And it's actually a very slow process just for me in terms of like setting up the camera, the tripod loading, there's only 10 images per rolls, and then you have to switch roles. And that was very intentional partially because I love film and I love the way photographs look mm -hmm. when they are made, you know, taken on film. But also it was another way for like to invest in, mm -hmm. in myself as an artist and to model that honestly for our kids. And so I think it's, I am, you know, in these times where I have these like tiny little scraps of time to work with, this is what I'm choosing, right? I want to like not take the shortcut, mm -hmm. I guess, which has been certainly something that I've had to do for various reasons. And that's, you know, totally, totally fine. But I think given the opportunity, I want to sort of do it the right way or the way mm -hmm. that, you know, I think would work best and really take that time and not rush through because I'm feeling pressure from, you know, all of the other areas of my life. <laughs> yeah. So it's not easy. And that's probably why it's, mm -hmm. I'm slow. Like it, it takes me a while to, you know, to shoot, to find the right time and, and space and obviously light. And, you know, there's all those factors mm -hmm. too, but it is deliberate on my part yeah, to do that. But I have thought about like, okay, this other like back catalog of work, like, do I need to open up a little like side, like like a print shop or something like that? I think they're really interesting, lovely images. They're just not particularly like related to this other like fine artwork that I do. But mm -hmm. anyway, these are things I'm just kind of mulling over in my head. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I mean, it's helpful to hear that because I feel like there are so many artists that have these sort of multiple levels of, you know, like I sell cards right. on Etsy and I have like designs on Spoonflower and whatever. Like I'm not saying sure, I do, but, yeah, but like yes. <laughs> an artist, you know, has all these different things. And then there's like the gallery work yes. and, you know, that there's all these levels of how do you piece it all together and make a life as an artist? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Make yeah. a living. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, it's it's yeah. yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky for sure. Totally. And you mentioned that you were at Stay Home Gallery and Residency. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. So again, um, another just wonderful opportunity to invest in myself and it and in my work. I first read about Stay Home Gallery and Residency, I want to say last summer. And I was immediately like 
talking to my husband, like, can we make this work? This would just be, you know, so amazing. And we could. So I, I reached out. They were already, I think, booked for, for the year yeah. by the time I reached out. They were so amazingly, I'm so happy that they're so popular because I think it clearly yeah. there's such a need there, right? Mm-hmm. There was a need that they filled, obviously, for any kind of residency for women, women identifying people and potentially their families. And that was what really made it work for us. But the fact that I could bring our kids and my husband. Mm -hmm. And so he took the week off of work and managed remote learning from there. And so I could have Mm -hmm. that week to be in the studio. And I mean, the last time I did a residency was like 10 years prior or more, 12 years before. So pre-marriage, pre-kids, pre-everything and just a totally different, you know, time in my life, which was wonderful. But I think, you know, I view time so differently now because I feel like yeah. I have so much less of it. And so being able to, one, not be like, just to have that space, like literal space is very rural. And so, I mean, even just seeing the stars at night was like beautiful. It was so wonderful. And I actually was able mm-hmm. to take photos of them, which was also just so fun. And to have this uninterrupted time to really think mm-hmm. and be productive, but also just read and play. I mean, I love materials. I love art materials. I think it's another reason why I teach. And so, you know, I, I've been like hoarding these random things over the years and I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm just going to play around with them. Like have certain things that I knew I wanted to shoot or get done, but also I need to build into this time, time to just like not care. Right. Because I think when there's such a limit on time, everything feels like the stakes are so much higher. And so to not have to feel that was just wonderful. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, obviously, I love them. I love what they've done. Thinking about how you mentioned that your last residency before that was before kids, before marriage, all of that when you were sort of unencumbered. (laughs) I don't know if that's the right word, but yes, that so many, you know, even a lot of the residencies that say, oh, yeah, we're family friendly. Sure. There's just a different level of understanding what that really, really means. You know, is there actually space? Like, do you have multiple bedrooms? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, is there childcare available or like a partner that is allowed to come and has space to be there? (laughs) You know? Yes. Yeah. Right. And also, again, like I have to acknowledge the fact that I have a partner, one, and that a partner who could take that time. I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I take for granted at all. Luckily, I've seen so many articles recently about the lack of family-friendly residencies that I'm really, I'm hoping that this is a new trend that people are just going to jump on board and realize (laughs) that it's important. And, you know, if you Mm -hmm. want different kinds of artists to be able to participate in those opportunities, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. So hopefully it will, it will be. Yeah. Yeah. That's another place where I feel hopeful. Yeah. I do too. I do too. Fingers crossed. Yes. (laughs) I wanted to ask if there are any sort of resources that have been really helpful to you that you would want to point people towards, which that could mean books that have been really helpful, or if there's either in terms of art making or teaching, like really great websites people need to go check out or be looking at, Mm -hmm. or, you know, I loved the, the hashtag you shared first day, first image. Yeah. Anything else, any other sort of resources you'd want to point people towards? Yes, absolutely. My brain is like running through (laughs) the Rolodex of ideas right now, but I feel like I've just been diving deep into gathering resources this year in a variety of topics, right? And so we talked Mm -hmm. earlier about how Mm -hmm. to bring anti-racism into our classroom. There's a wonderful daily newsletter called Anti-Racism Daily. Mm -hmm. And it's Nicole Cardoza, I believe is her name, who does it. And it's, again, been super useful Mm -hmm. personally. I think also in terms of art things, I would say locally, the Chicago Artist Coalition is a wonderful organization that provides a ton of opportunities. And they Mm -hmm. always have listings for calls for art or space finder if you're looking for a studio. And there's just lots of very practical tools there. I think, again, I'm so not a social media person, but Instagram has been 
really useful for me in this past year. I feel like that's how I found the Stay Home Gallery. It's how I found the Artist Mother podcast and community. I'm pretty sure it's how I found your podcast. It's just all kind of linked together. And also just finding other artists who are doing, you know, interesting things that I find inspiring. Yeah. That's been really lovely. I've actually, I think maybe this is also related to your work, but I've been loving for teaching the resources from the Visionary Art Collective that they're putting out. So all of the teaching PDFs and things like that, just in very practical ways have been useful. Those are the ones that are top of mind. There's so many though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough. Yeah, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but those are great. Yeah, I feel like it's always helpful just to add to my list of resources. And I love how you said it's like this Rolodex, like <laughs> in it your is. brain or in your, I have so many bookmarks. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, I've had a real, like, I need to limit the number of tabs I have open on my computer because I've right. had to like, just turn them into bookmarks, many of them, because I've just had way too many open <laughs> for way too long. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it gets to the point where I'm like, oh no, I need to restart, but I can't lose all of these. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, Glad I'm not the only one. No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> Okay, a few just fun questions. What are you curious about right now? Ooh, I, okay. Hmm, so much. Yeah. I feel like a very curious person in general, but I would say, well, thinking big, like in a macro sort of sense, I'm curious about what I, and also kind of like the collective we will take from this past year and keep as we move hopefully into mm -hmm. sort of a more normal life if that makes sense. And so I feel like even just as more mm. people are vaccinated, things are changing, things are starting to open up, all of which is great. But I also feel like there's a lot to be learned from our experiences the last year. And there's certainly personally and how our family dynamic worked or like there are a lot of things that I want to hold on to and not just like rush back to how things were before. If that makes sense. I'm curious how that will manifest on the personal level, but mm -hmm. also in schools, on yeah. the professional level, kind of everywhere. Yeah. Like on a systemic level, but then also very yes. personal. Yeah. Within your family. Yeah, and even for sure. The most I'm just it's maybe top of mind, the episode with Mallory Moya, and she talked so much about connecting to your body and your body place that it is right now. And mm. you know, like going down mm -hmm. into that that level oh, like how that. has this shifted for your physical like being totally bringing it out like for your family for your community for the systems in place in this country yes. that need to be broken yes. down <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> like, yeah yes i totally yes 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> like smash the patriarchy <laughs> yes Exactly. Oh my gosh. Oh. I mean, yeah, what a giant flashlight on all of the mm -hmm. cracks in so many of the systems. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what this year has been. So yeah. And hopefully, as we open up, we don't just turn that off and go back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that would be a huge opportunity lost. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's yeah. hope that doesn't happen. I don't think it will. I think people are hopefully aware enough that they won't let that happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have another just fun question. <laughs> what is your favorite food? Oh, I love food so much. This is a challenging one. Yeah. So <laughs> I would one. say I associate a lot of, I have a lot of like food memories too from growing up that are important, mm -hmm. but I would say currently I, I love Japanese food in general. So sushi, ramen, anything along those lines, mm -hmm. we are lucky to live near a lot of Japanese community. So there's lots of really wonderful grocery stores and restaurants. And one of my favorite things is going to any type of international grocery store. I don't know if this was like from growing up, that was kind of, you know, a, a byproduct of that, but it's something I love. And now we get to take our kids and, you know, explore that too, which is really fun. So that's what I would say. <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. Yeah. I agree on that nice. one. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone you would want to give a thank you or a shout out to? Ooh, I love that. Let's see. I would say I'll work sort of small and then go up. So I feel like I certainly my family, my husband for being an extremely supportive partner, you know, given that he took the time off for the residency and he's just always been very supportive of my art making in general and art career and teaching career. I would say... My sister, who last summer moved to California, which was 
she had been living here for ages. And so that was a tough transition. She got a wonderful job, but she is also in the art world. She's a curator. And so has been very supportive and also just so instrumental in exposing me to all sorts of new and interesting artists and art making happening. And then also, I feel like I should name the organization that I teach at is called Marwen, M-A-R-W-E-N. It's a great nonprofit in Chicago. If there are any teaching artists who are in the area that you are interested in connecting with other teaching artists, it's Mm -hmm. just a great community. And, you know, hopefully when things open back up, they'll have a lot of opportunities. So I would definitely want to shout them out as well. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. And last (laughs) thing, where can listeners connect with you online? Yes. So my website is katherinerodriguez.com. And I'm going to spell it because both names are spelled slightly differently. It's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N for Catherine. Mm -hmm. And then Rodriguez is R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-S as in Sam, because it's (laughs) Portuguese. (laughs) And so on Instagram, same, it's Mm Catherine.Rodriguez is my Instagram handle. So I've been really enjoying posting there way more than I had been. It's just nice sort of visual treat that I like to partake in. So I've been trying to engage there as much as possible. Yeah, amazing. And I will link to both of those as well. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This was wonderful, Catherine. It's so great to meet you. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.